John Sharp is going to have our lesson today on John and from John 1 8. John himself was not the light, he was only a witness to the light. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. My name is John. I grew up a Baptist, <laughs> but I am not John the Baptist, just so you know that. I had to clarify. Thank you, John. You're welcome. You eat different food? <laughs> I should, but I don't. Um, as Martha Jane said, we have been, uh, during Advent, using one of Adam Hamilton's uh, books, Prepare the Way of the Lord. Uh, the last two weeks, we focused on the story surrounding John's birth and early years in his ministry. In the two chapters that we're going to cover today, we'll focus on John's preaching, baptizing ministry, his life, legacy, <laughs> and how John may have impacted the ministry of Christ. Um, and we will be seeing two videos, uh, so you won't have to hear me a lot. But Adam Hamilton does a great job, as you know. John was most likely educated and influenced by the Essenes from an early age. This community lived on the northeast shore of the Dead Sea. The Essenes had devoted themselves to preparing for the coming of the Messiah. The Essenes practiced ritual bathing, baptism, or purification. They carefully studied the scriptures and sought to live holy and devout lives. They lived simply, and they sought to withdraw from the sinful world. They believed in a coming apocalyptic, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. This community is believed to have produced many of the Dead Sea Scrolls because they were living in the area where a lot of them have been found. The Essenes likely influenced the way John lived and dressed. However, where the Essenes were an exclusive community that sought to separate themselves from the sinful world, John went throughout the region of the Jordan River, calling for people to change their lives, baptizing them, and teaching them to look to God for forgiveness. The question still exists today. Are we inclusive of all people, or do we still feel that only certain people are worthy of God's love? It's possible that John and Jesus spent a lot of time together, or some time, because they were relatives. And Jesus could have been exposed to the teachings of the Essenes through his exposure, his relationship with John. This would reinforce the fact that Jesus, as he learned from other people, he was both human and divine because the human part of him would have wanted to learn as much as possible. John was direct and harsh while Jesus showed compassion and mercy. Jesus was and is humble and loving toward all people. We're getting ready. John's ministry was very much about the second coming of Jesus, whether when Jesus returns to this earth or when we meet Jesus at the end of our individual lives. And we're going to watch, uh, as I said, two videos, and we'll hear Adam Hamilton give us a lot more on this. <laughs>
It's a joy to be with you again today. Thank you so much on this third week of Advent. And uh, today we're going to turn to John's ministry and his preaching. So we're going to have a chance to think about what happened to him when he became a man. And I want to start with what happens at the end of Luke chapter 1, verse 80. So we find that John is, uh, is you know, he was born, he was uh, circumcised, and his father pronounces a blessing over him. And then we find that uh, we read these words, the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. So nothing else from his eighth day when he was circumcised until, until we read this. And the next thing we find is chapter three, he starts his public ministry. So what we know is that somehow at a certain age, maybe he was five, maybe he was 10, he goes to live in the wilderness. Now, it may be that his mom and dad uh, perished, they died, uh, they were older when they had him, so perhaps he was left an orphan. In this case, it's possible that his mother and father took him to live in a community of monastics, uh, priests and, and other religious people on the banks of the, or on the shoreline of the Dead Sea. This community was called the Essenes, and they lived in the wilderness. The wilderness in, in the Holy Land is like a desert. It's barren, it's, it's beautiful, but it's barren. And they set up their community there so they could hear from God and so they could prepare the way for the Lord. They understood themselves to be preparing the way for the Lord, the, the way for the Messiah. So this is what we read next. Uh, this fast forwards 30 to 35 years, and we come to this. During the high priest, this is Luke chapter 3. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So he grew up in the wilderness. He's in the wilderness when God's word come to, comes to him. John went throughout the region of the Jordan, calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives. Again, this is preparing the way for the Lord personally. Changing their hearts and lives, repenting, and, and that they wanted God to forgive their sins. This is just as it was written in the scroll of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. So Isaiah foretold a day when the Israelites or the Jewish people would be coming back from exile in Babylon. Someone would go before and prepare the way for the Lord to lead them out. And from that time on, people understood that before God was going to do something great or before the Messiah would come, there would be somebody preparing the way. John understood himself to be one of those people. The community of the Essenes, the sect within first century Judaism, they defined themselves by this verse. We are here preparing the way in the wilderness for the Lord to come. And, uh, and so I want to tell you just a little bit more about that. The Essenes were deeply devoted to God. They, had, uh, they were ascetics, so they, they ate you know, very simply. They dressed very simply. They lived very simply. They didn't believe in marriage, so they were uh, typically men who lived in this, uh, in this community. They uh, would welcome boys and young men who were wanting to follow the same path. And so parents who either, uh, you know, if there was a child who was left orphaned, they might be taken there. Or if a parent believed that their child was destined to be a priest like this, they might take them there. And so it appears that John the Baptist was taken to this community. So they shared much in common, John and the Essenes, the asceticism, the devotion to God, the desire to prepare the way for the Lord. But there came a break in this community between John and the Essenes. And that break seemed to happen related to the Essenes thinking that what God really wanted was for them to separate themselves from sinners. And what John came to see was that God wanted to reach sinners. He wanted to draw sinners to him. He didn't want to separate himself from them. He wanted to reach them. And so uh, the Essenes, they would purify themselves. They would, uh, several times a day, they would step into what were called mikvah or baptismal fonts, step out, and they would be purified once more. It was really about purity. And John says, you know, maybe what God wants is for us to go out there where the people are and to reach out to them. So it's interesting, Christian people to this day, or religious people to this day, continue to struggle with this. Do we separate ourselves from sinners? Or are we actually here to reach out to people who are broken or sinful or separated from God? Some years ago, there was a woman who came into church one Sunday, and she said, Pastor, I mean, you won't believe what happened in the parking lot. I was pulling into a parking space, and, and I pulled in, and I guess the guy on the other side thought that that was his parking space, and you know the parking lot was pretty jam-packed that day. And she said, when I pulled in, he honked his horn, and he flipped me the bird. And can you believe it, Pastor Adam? Somebody would flip me the bird in the parking lot of the church. And I said, isn't that awesome? Then really, that's just, that's just awesome because you know, church people know not to flip the bird in the parking lot. So this must be an unchurched person. And that's exactly the kind of people want to reach. How, awful, how awesome is that, that you know, this person was out there? And, and that, it's that kind of mindset that says, you know, our, our aim is to welcome people and to help them find love and grace and mercy. And that's what John the Baptist is doing, is he goes out to where the people are. And he starts wearing the clothing of Elijah the prophet, who lived hundreds of years before him. And, uh, and as he's wearing this clothing, you know, the, the hair, the, the camel hair and the leather belt, and he, you know, he's eating these you know, uh, locusts and wild honey. And he's trying to say, look, I'm the Elijah that was to come. I'm the prophet who's coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so get ready. Get ready for this. All right, so, so as we think about this, 
uh, I think about the Essene community. So John lived there for much of his life. And as he lived there for most of his life, if you go visit the Essene community, you can walk in the ruins of the place where likely John the Baptist walked. That's what amazes me. Every time I'm there, I'm thinking, am I walking where John the Baptist walked? And these were, many of them were scribes, and so they copied the, the scriptures. And uh, when you see the Dead Sea Scrolls, you, know, you begin to wonder, is it possible that some of these are the handwriting of John the Baptist? It's pretty amazing. Anyway, in AD 68, the Romans were coming in, suppressing a rebellion of the Jewish people. Before they destroyed Jerusalem in, in AD 70, they marched down to the south, and they were heading towards uh, Masada, and they were heading, they would go right past the community at Quran. So the monks took their scrolls, their thousand scrolls, probably more we haven't found yet, but thousand scrolls, put them in, in clay jars, put them in caves that were really hard to access along the edge of the sea, at the, at the Dead Sea. And then they left to go to Masada, and presumably they were all killed. Nobody came back for those scrolls. Until there was a little Bedouin uh, uh, shepherd, and I don't remember if it was a sheep or a goat, but in 1946, one of his animals made its way into one of the caves, and the boy was afraid to go in, so he took a rock and he threw it in the cave to try to get his animal out, and he heard a clay pot breaking. And he came back with a lantern to see what was inside, and he found the first Dead Sea Scroll, the most amazing archaeological discovery in almost 2,000 years. And this is the Dead Sea, and this is from near Qumran, and here you begin to see some of the caves uh, in the hillsides. It's, this is the wilderness of Judea, and you see more of these caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. This cave that you see here is cave number four. It's where 90% of the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And you can see how hard it would have been to get there to these places and why they managed to avoid being found for so long. And, and again, this is a picture of what the, the area around the Dead Sea looks like, what the wilderness looks like, where this community lived. And then now you see the ruins of Qumran. You can see the baptistries here, the mikvah, where they would step in one set of steps they would st and purify themselves, purge themselves under the water, and step out the other side. And back in the background to the left is the Dead Sea. So uh, this gives you a sense of where John the Baptist may have grown up. Now when John begins preaching, now this is what we read. This is in Luke's, Luke's Gospel. Then John said to the crowd, so there were multitudes who came to, to hear John preach. They came from all over the place. Then John said to the crowds who came to be baptized by him, You children of snakes, who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. And don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise Abraham's children from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce fr good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. He's preaching a pretty harsh word. Jesus is much gentler compared to this most of the time. Jesus preaches like this to the religious leaders, but to most people, he's much, much gentler in his approach. But he's offering, he's saying, look, judgment is coming. The Messiah is coming. Be prepared. Get ready for the judgment day. And, uh, and then they say, well, what should we do? And so the crowds asked him, what should we do? And he answered, whoever has two shirts must share with the one who has none, and whoever has food must do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. They, shared, they said to him, teacher, what should we do? It's amazing. Tax collectors, sinners coming, you know, who, who are really notorious sinners. Teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more than you are authorized to collect. And soldiers came and asked, what about us? What should we do? And he answered, don't cheat or harass anyone and be satisfied with your pay. I want you to notice this that every example he gives of what it means to repent has to do with economics. It has to do with compassion. It has to do with being content with what you have, not wanting more than you have, and then being willing to share what you have with people who are in need. At our churches we do this, and hopefully we do this year round. This should be the rhythm of our lives. But certainly at Advent, we, most of our churches end up doing even more than we normally do to provide for people who are in need, provide groceries, provide Christmas meals, to make sure everybody has Christmas presents. And part of that is trying to fulfill what John has said we do in preparing the way for the Lord. So Advent is about preparation. That's what we do during that season and the rest of the year. A friend of mine, a pastor of a church in, in Ohio, Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church, Mike Slaughter. He's no longer the pastor there now. He retired several years ago, but he and I are good friends. And, and uh, about 15 years ago, he started doing something where he challenged his congregation to give an amount in the Christmas Eve offering equal to what they spent on their own family. And in doing that, that money was going to go to benefit people who were in need, to help people, in his case, particularly in Africa. Now, pastors are sometimes competitive, and uh, Mike's a good friend of mine, and I thought, well, if Mike Slaughter can do that and Ginghamsburg can do it, we can do it too. And so we began challenging our, own, our congregation the same. We would say, I'd like for you to consider 
giving away an amount equal to what you spend on your own Christmas. We started giving our kids, uh, uh, we would spend so much on presents that we would give them a check for even more than that and say, now this is yours to give away, to find somebody who needs this or to find you know, causes that you're going to support to benefit people who are in need. And what we found is it changed our lives. It really changed how we thought about Christmas. It changed our values. It reset our lives. And pretty soon we found there were hundreds of other people doing this in our congregation. And our Christmas Eve offering quadrupled in size as we were b being able to give away you know, now millions of dollars to people who were in poverty, children in poverty in Kansas City and across the world. It really changed us as a congregation. So that leads me to John's baptism. So the people repented. They were standing there by the river, and he's standing by the river because what he wants is some way for them to demonstrate, I want to be washed. I want to be new. I want to be made clean. Some years ago, I went to the Jordan River by myself. This is about six miles north of the Dead Sea. And uh, while I was there by myself, I thought, I want to just, there was no other group with me. We were filming something, and I thought, I want to see what this was like. So I changed into a robe, and I, uh, I, I stepped into the, into the river. I was shocked, first of all, by how narrow the river was, how small it was. I stepped in, and the water comes up to about here, about chest high. What really stood out to me was the mushiness of the clay squishing between my toes. And I thought, Jesus felt this. The disciples felt this. John the Baptist felt this when he stepped in. And then thinking about stepping into that water, and I, I just submerged myself in the water and thought, Jesus, please wash me. Take away all the crud in my life and help me to be clean and new in you. And you know, all that stuff then flows right into the Dead Sea where nothing can live again. I thought you might enjoy seeing a group of people being immersed there in the Jordan. Some had never been baptized. Some were renewing their baptism. This was a group of young adults I took there several years ago. And I want you to notice what the Jordan looks like. I want you to imagine what it felt like as they were stepping into the water. Take a look. So there's four of us clergy who stepped in first. And you can see the water. It looks dirty. It's actually just the, the silt from the clay after 120 miles or 150 miles of traveling from the Sea of Galilee. And then our people began to step in and we again baptized some who'd never been baptized and others, you know, we immersed them in the water and we were remembering their baptism. We didn't rebaptize, but we remembered their baptisms. And as they stepped in there, they had a chance to experience what Jesus and the disciples experienced, what all of those crowds experienced when John invited them to repent and to be baptized. And this imagery of all of our sins being carried away, but it wasn't just our sins being carried away. It was God washing us. It wasn't just God washing us. It was the promise that he would fill us with his living water of the Holy Spirit. It was a reminder that we belong to God and that in Jesus' baptism, God said, you are my beloved child. And we remember that we are God's beloved children. And in our baptisms, we remember that we became a part of the family of God. So today, I want to invite you to remember your baptism. And those of you who are at home, you might try this in your own, you know, whatever, if you're at home or Sunday school, or you might invite your pastor to have a renewal of baptism uh, ceremony. But we're going to take some water here. And I'm just going to invite you to take the water and make the sign of the cross on your forehead and just pause and remember, you were baptized. You belong to Jesus. You are his. And so remember your baptism. And as we remember our baptisms here, I want to invite you to remember your baptisms at home. And I'm going to invite you at home to bow in prayer with me. Oh God, we remember our baptisms. And if we've never been baptized, I pray, oh Lord, those who haven't been baptized, that they would reach out to their pastor to find out how they can be baptized. And in our baptisms, we not only die to ourself, we confess to you our need for forgiveness. And as we feel the water on our forehead or passing over as we as if we're fully immersed in the water we remember your grace and mercy and your love for us lord we repent of our sins and we long to follow you prepare us so that each day we can live for you as your people prepare us for that day when you return and we meet you face to face thank you O oh lord for our baptisms and for your love and grace in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
All right, well, this is our last session now for our study of Prepare the Way for the Lord, and I am so grateful that you've joined us and that you've been studying this book, and I hope it's blessed you as much as it's blessed me as I was writing it, studying for it, and preparing it. And as we come to this last session, we're going to be talking about John's account, John the Disciple's account of John the Baptist. Many people look at John's gospel, and, and in fact, even in the early church, they said that John's gospel was the spiritual gospel. And they called it that because he tells the story differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are pretty straightforward, fairly easy to understand what they're trying to say. In John's gospel, Jesus uses different language. He talks about himself a lot more. It's uh, a bit more esoteric. Some people love the gospel of John. I wrote a book on the gospel of John. I really do love the gospel of John, but John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a bit different. And again, John's a little harder sometimes to understand all right, so as we come to this, I want you to remember what John says as he's introducing his gospel. And we read this, at least at Resurrection, we read this on Candlelight Christmas Eve every single year. And so listen to these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word. Nothing came into being without the Word. What came into being through the Word was life. And the life was the light of all people. So he's talking about Jesus. And the word is, it, it, in essence, it means God's revealing of himself. It means God's wisdom, God's knowledge, logos. It's the, it is the essence of God has become flesh in Jesus. And he is the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. Now listen, a man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. So the very fact that John had to write that tells us there were some people who might have thought that John was the light and that Jesus wasn't. And so he's trying to be really clear that John's mission, his purpose, was to testify concerning the light, which is Jesus. That's John 1, 1 through 8. So Jesus and John, again, had their own followers, uh, and, and John was pointing people towards Jesus, but there were many who continued to follow uh, John the Baptist. And we see that throughout the Gospels as well. In John 3.26, we read that the disciples of John approached John, this is before he was in prison, and they said, Rabbi, look, the man who was with you across the Jordan, that is Jesus, the one whom you testified about, is baptizing and everyone is flocking to him. Can you feel what his disciples are feeling? John's disciples are feeling a bit jealous. They're uncertain, like, wait a minute, what, what should we do about this? Should we, should we maybe let people know that the real one is you and not him and and so you can feel that kind of jealousy and we all have a tendency to feel that way as human beings you know I will tell you pastors if they see a church that's growing you know faster than their church they start to feel a little insecure like wait what's you know what's going on over there and then we have a tendency maybe even to say bad things about somebody else because it makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves this is just part of human nature but here's what, I, here's what John said and I love this he says no one can receive anything unless it is given from heaven so he's saying if he's getting people coming to hear and these amazing things are happening, it must be that God has given him these gifts. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Christ, but that I'm the one sent before him. The groom is the one who is getting married. The friend of the groom stands close by. When he hears him, he is overjoyed at the groom's voice. So I'm the best man, but he's the groom, and I'm going to celebrate at what's happening here. And then this is the line that I love. Therefore, my joy is now complete, he must increase, and I must decrease. I wonder if you hear what a remarkable thing that is. You know, we think about it in our lives. You know, we all like to be the winner. We all like to be number one. We want to, you know, and I'm a super competitive person, and maybe some of you are as well. And, and yet, John the Baptist is teaching us something really important. And Jesus said of John the Baptist that no one, no human being was ever greater than John the Baptist, even though he is least in the kingdom of heaven. And so here's John the Baptist, and he demonstrates his greatness here. He must increase, and I must decrease. And, you know, we live in a world today where it seems like there's a whole lot of people who are really in it for themselves. And that's, you know, that can be all of us. I, I can tell you I know the feelings of that. I, I am a very uh, driven person, and I remember years ago I was praying because I felt a sense of ambition, you know. I was like, and then I would pray, Jesus, take this away. Take away my ambition. I don't want to be ambitious. I want to be just a humble servant. And, and after praying that for about a year, I heard Jesus speak to me in my head, and he said this, I can't take it away, and I won't take it away, but I'm going to use it for me and not for you. And I love there's a psalm that says, there's a verse in the psalm that says, Not to us, O Lord, but to thy name give glory. And so there's something about learning how to fix your heart on that, that it's not about me, and help it be about others, and help us to be people who encourage and bless and build up 
instead of getting competitive and then jealous or insecure and acting out of our insecurities. And that's what I see in John. He must increase, that I must decrease. So I want to turn now to John the Baptist's death. And John was probably 34, 35 years old, maybe 33 when he died. And, uh, and so here's what happened. He was preaching up and down the Jordan River. He was preaching on both sides of the Jordan River. We, we read in John's Gospel, he preached on the other side of the Jordan River. The other side of the Jordan, the eastern side of the Jordan was Perea. So John is preaching in Perea. Uh, the king or the, the ruler over Perea was a man named Herod Antipas. He was a son of Herod the Great. Now Herod Antipas ruled over the eastern side of the Jordan and he ruled over the Galilee where Jesus spent most of his time in ministry. So uh, Herod Antipas you know, knows about John the Baptist. Everybody knows about John the Baptist. He was a very well-known figure. And, uh, and he wants to hear John the Baptist. He's interested in what he has to say. But John the Baptist pretty quickly ends up offending Herod Antipas. So this is recorded in several of the Gospels. And it's also recorded in uh, Josephus, in uh, the first century Jewish historian. So what happens is Herod Antipas falls in love with his sister-in-law. And so his brother Philip was married to a woman named Herodias, and he falls in love with Herodias. She also happens to be his niece. So this is like the worst kind of soap opera you could watch on Netflix, and you don't ever want to tell anybody you were watching this. So uh, he falls in love with his niece slash sister-in-law, and convinces her to leave her husband, Philip, and to become married to him. Now, uh, Herod Antipas is also married at this time. So he's married to the daughter of the king of the Nabataeans, which is a country that's south and east of the Holy Land. And so he divorces his wife, which makes the Nabataean king not very happy because his daughter has been jilted by you know, Herod Antipas. But Herod marries Herodias, and, uh, and so John the Baptist hears about this, and he starts preaching and saying, this is not okay. So uh, John the Baptist gets arrested. And he's arrested, put in prison. And, and for a while that goes okay because Herod Antipas wants to talk to him. So he goes down to his prison cell and he talks to him. Scripture says that, uh, that there was a dinner party that was being held. And his, I think it's his stepdaughter, I don't think it was actually his physical daughter, stepdaughter, comes in and she dances for Herod, uh, Herod Antipas. And then at the end of the dance, he says, you know, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. Kind of a stupid thing to promise uh, in front of your friends. So she goes and asks her mother, Herodias, who was Herod Antipas' niece and ex-sister-in-law and now his wife, um, what should I ask for? <laughs> exactly, what should I ask for? And, uh, and she says, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Yeah. And... Uh, so she went and asked for this, and Herod Antipas didn't really want to kill John the Baptist, but he was too embarrassed to say no. And off with John the Baptist's head, brought on a platter, and John's disciples come and take him, his body, his head, and bury him. It was a tragedy. It was a terrible tragedy. Jesus, you can see, is affected by this deeply when he dies. And uh, John the Baptist knew what could happen to him, and he had the courage to speak up and say, this is not okay. And this was the price that he paid. So I think about that, and, and this is where I want to begin to end. I don't know when you're watching this video, but I know it was recorded in, uh, in 2022. And in 2022, in the early part of 2022, Vladimir Putin sent troops into Ukraine, a, nation, a neighboring nation that did nothing to provoke this. And uh, 200,000 troops, and they bombed the smithereens, Mariupol, and a few other places. And I don't know how the war ends. You're, you're watching this in December, and you know how it ends. I don't know yet. But when we look at this and we see what's happened there, you know, part of what you see is how absolute power can corrupt absolutely, or how people can begin to think it's okay to use your power to take what you want, even though it's not really yours to take. And here's the other thing we know, is that evil and injustice and cruelty and inhumanity never get to have the final word. They just don't. No, you, you can, you know, evil can last for 10 or 15 years in a regime, but eventually it's going to be brought down. It always is. Sometimes it's 20 years or 50 years, but it's always brought down. And what we see happened in the case of Herod Antipas is that the king of Nabataea, who was upset because Herod Antipas divorced his daughter, sends his troops over and they just crush King Herod Antipas' army. And then the Romans send him off into exile, and he ends up just an abandoned and broken leader. Uh, who eventually dies in exile. I mean, evil doesn't get to have the final word, even if it seems to have it for a time. All right, so that leads me to the picture of John the Baptist as testifying to the light. 
So throughout this, we've been trying to learn, you know, what story, from the stories of his childhood, what do we learn about the character of God and how God works? And then, you know, we've learned about his message and what is his message for us and what does it mean for us to repent and to be baptized and remember our baptism. And, but we also look at John and we think he's also a model for us for how we can live as those who testify to the light. We are not the light, but we testify to the light. I have a nice telescope at home. I enjoy taking it out on a, on a dark night. and It's a Mead LX90. It's a pr pretty nice scope. I take it outside, but if there's a full moon, it's interesting. I love to look at the moon, but looking at the full moon is not great because it's so bright, it really hurts your eyes. And, uh, and so you can see, and, and you really want the shadows that come from the sunlight hitting it at a, you know, at a bit of an angle. But when I've taken it out there, you have to put a lunar filter on the, on the, you know, on the eyepiece just so you don't hurt yourself. And I find it interesting when I think about that full moon or, you know, at night when, I, when it just keeps me awake at night coming in the, in the bedroom windows. The moon doesn't generate any light itself. It only reflects the light. And we don't generate light ourselves, neither does John. But we're meant to reflect the light of Christ in our lives. Jesus says in John's gospel, I'm the light of the world. And then he says in, in Matthew's gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill that can't be hidden. Let your light so shine before others that they might see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, this is the last Sunday of Advent, or whatever day you're looking at, you're watching this. It's the last week of Advent. And what's coming up this week is candlelight Christmas Eve. And at candlelight Christmas Eve, we darken the room, and we have one little candle come in, and we remember a baby was born. And that baby was the light of the world. And that baby came to change the world, to transform the world, and to transform us. Our king came to us. And one day he will return again. He will come again. And this whole season has been about getting ready. But it's not just about getting ready ourselves. It's about helping other people get ready too. You see, that's why John left the, the, the Essene community at Qumran, is they all felt like they were ready. But he said, our job is to go help other people get ready. And so I want to invite you to think about how you can be John the Baptist for other people this week. Who is it that you can tell the story to? Who is it that you might invite? Who is it you might say, hey, I don't know if you have a church home, but we have candlelight Christmas Eve, and it's so beautiful as we sing Silent Night and pass the candlelight throughout the room, and, you know, we all need a little bit of light right now. I mean, what would it look like for you to invite somebody else to see the light of Christ or for you to show them the light of Christ in such a compelling way that they find themselves drawn to the Jesus whose light you reflect? That's ultimately what we're trying to do in, in imitating or following John the Baptist. So here's what I want to ask you, those of you at home and those of you here as we're preparing to close this up. First of all, of what do you need to repent this Advent? I mean, in, where have you wandered just a little bit and you need to come back in thought, word, or deed by what you've done or by what you've left undone? Are you producing fruit worthy of repentance, which looks like acts of compassion and mercy for people who are in need, generosity and care? Are you ready to meet Christ face to face if something were to happen to you today? If on the way home from wherever you are, there was a car accident and that was it, are you ready to meet him? And for him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. That's a question we're meant to ask in Advent. And to whom will you testify to the light as we approach candlelight Christmas Eve? Who will you let see? Who will you invite? How will you use your social media influence or whatever influence you have to say, I'm going to be at church you know, here on candlelight Christmas Eve. I'd love for you to join me. It's really a special time. Or maybe somebody will pick up the phone and call and say, hey, would you want to sit by me for candlelight Christmas Eve? I've found a lot of people will come if you ask them personally. And then finally, again, how will you reflect Christ's light in the year ahead? All right, it's Advent, and our King has already come, and he's going to come again. And we're all meant to prepare the way in our own lives and to be used by God to prepare the way for someone else. Let's do that together. And let's pray. Oh God, how grateful we are for the light that you bring to us in Jesus. He is the light of the world, and the darkness could not overcome it. How grateful, oh God, that you sent John the Baptist to show us what it means to repent and to prepare and to call us to repentance and to testify to the light. In Jesus' name, amen.